How's everybody doing? Hey, we are really glad that you're here. So let me tell you something that happened to me a while back. My family was at home. I was a day off for me. And uh, we all went swimming in our swimming pool. Uh, my daughter, Mia, gets out, goes inside for something. A few minutes later, I decide to get out of the pool and start making lunch for all of us. When I go to go inside on our side door, I oh, go to open the door. The door handle comes completely off. And uh, I'm, I was stuck outside. Thankfully, my daughter Mia had gone inside or month, I'd still be outside, uh, you know. So I decide, look, I'm going to make lunch and then I'm going to, uh, I'll take care of the door. So I make lunch for everybody. I go to Home Depot to buy a new door handle. Now, truth be told, I had to buy two door handles because I had this idea that I would take the door handle from the other door that led outside and fix the first door. In taking the door handle off, Anyway, I ended up breaking door, both door handles. It's not really important to the story, but anyway, that's why I bought two door handles. So <clears throat> I go to Home Depot, I come back with the door handles, and I start installing the first one. And you know how when you're installing something, it never works out the way it does, when, like, the way it's supposed to be? At least that's at least my story when I try to fix things. Um, so I, I, I get it on, but it won't lock, like the, the latch, it won't, it won't latch. So um, my wife says, why don't you install the other one and see if it works? I install the other one, it works perfectly. So now I'm back to the one where the handle came off completely. And uh, this is the one that's giving me problems. So I take the entire thing apart. I watched this YouTube video that the company that manufactured these door handles, they have a YouTube channel. All they do is show you how to install these door handles. And, you know, the spokesperson for the company, I mean, it's just, you know, she's like, this door handle is so easy to install. Anyone can do it. Like, apparently not, lady! And uh, so... Anyway, I, t I take the whole door handle apart because Albert Einstein said you don't understand something unless you take it apart. I don't know if he actually said that. <laughs> I just sometimes like to attribute things that I do to Albert Einstein and some people don't know the difference. Uh, so anyway, um, <laughs> so I take the thing apart, I reassemble it, and, uh, and I just kind of make sure it's, before I screw the whole thing in, it's working. Everything's working. And as a typical man, I just declare in my bold proclamation, it is finished by the power vested in me and the power of Grayskull, I have done it. And so anyway, and uh, so all I have to do is tighten the screws. I tighten the screws and when I do, the handle won't lock. So I take the entire thing apart again. Oh, by the way, more than two hours have passed since I went to Home Depot and um, I'm putting the whole thing back together the second time, but this time it's not gonna get me. What I do is I, I get it together. I have the screws um, just in, to, but they're, they're loose, so, but it's working. Then I screw all of them in a quarter of the way, still working, halfway, still working, 75%, still working, 90%, still working, and I'm like, this project is finally done. Screw it in, stops working. And I'm like, you know what? Forget it, honey, we're moving. That's it. <laughs> And, uh, and that's how it stayed until I sold the house. And, uh, and there, the people will be looking at it like, why is this? I'm like, no, you got to shake it like you're inside of a blender and then the bolt just goes right in. Some doors are like that. Uh, it's the European model. And, uh, and so anyway, so this is the problem with human accomplishment is that it's never quite perfect. But when Jesus said the words at the, at the end, when he was on the cross, when he said, it is finished, it was perfect. It was perfect because Jesus gave us what we needed before we knew we even needed it. And it was perfect for us, but it was horrible for him. Because that's how love works. Love involves sacrifice. And one of the things, when I was asking my wife to marry me, um, I was already, I was in school full-time and I was working uh, almost full-time and I took a second job so that I could afford to buy her the engagement ring. And whenever my wife tells the story of how she got, whenever I gave her the engagement and asked her to marry me, she always tells the story of how I took on a second job to, uh, to buy the ring. And she always talks about the sacrifice that went into it. I, I don't ever tell that, tell that part of the story. What I do tell is this part of the story, which I have told about a million times. If you've been at Calvary for any less than a month, you've probably heard me tell the story six or seven times. Um, because I, I do tell it regularly because it was such an act of love, what I did. And uh, my kids were asking about it recently, and so I think it's important to bring up. But when my wife and I got married, I sold my 1983 Gibson Les Paul Standard in a piano black, what a beautiful guitar, and um, so that we could afford to move into our first apartment. It was the only guitar that I owned, but I sold it uh, because I love my wife. And as I'm telling you this, here's what you're thinking. What an incredible gesture 
this man, the depth of his love. I know that's what you're thinking because it's what I think all the time. And so, <laughs> and, um, and not only, and, and it, was, it was a traumatic moment in my life, I'll tell you that much, because I sold the guitar to the guy, and like six months later, I'm like, hey, I need to buy it back. And he's like, dude, I don't know, I sold it. And I'm like, really? Never talk to me again. And uh, so anyway, my wife has heard me tell this story so many times that the last time I told it, which is why I haven't told it in a while, she's like, you sold the guitar, you got me, get over it. And uh, she's like, you used to play the guitar, now you play with me. Put your life into perspective. And um, you don't have to clap for that. We don't want to encourage that kind of behavior. Uh, but it's hard to argue with that airtight logic. Now, we are in, as Pastor Alex mentioned, we are in message number 45 in our series in the Gospel of Matthew. And by the way, we have three messages left after today. Uh, we'll finish the chapter 27 and talk about what happens around the cross um, and, and, and we'll finish chapter 27 on Good Friday. And then on Easter, we'll take the first part of uh, chapter 28. And then the following week, we'll finish, uh, we'll finish the book. And then we got a whole bunch of fun stuff planned. Now, Jesus has been arrested. He has been sentenced to death. And now he's being carried away to crucifixion. And while this is gruesome, it is the greatest act of love the world has ever seen. And here's why. Because even the stories that I told you about sacrifice, it's what we tend to do. We tend to sacrifice for people that will love us in return. Jesus died for every person, most of whom, if, if not antagonistic towards him, were indifferent towards him. That's why when the Apostle Paul reflects on the cross in the book of Romans chapter 5, he says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, most of us know that Jesus died, but few of us know how Jesus died. And I believe that when you know how he died, you will love him that much more. And you'll, because you'll be able to see how much more he loves you than maybe you realized. So let's start in chapter 27. We're gonna start in uh, verse 32. Here's what we read. It says, now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him, divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for clothing they cast lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put over his head the accusation written against him, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Now, if you pause there and give me your attention, there's three things that we're going to look at about what the cross does in your life and in mine. But the first is, if you're a note taker, the cross is changing my legacy. Now, there's a few things that I want you to note in these verses, but the first thing is, is that with some help from a gentleman named Simon uh, from an area of Cyrene, Jesus arrives at Golgotha, uh, which means place of the skull. Golgotha is the Hebrew name for it. The Latin name for it is Calvary, and, um, which is the church you attend, by the way. Um, now, I know some people call it cavalry fellowship. That is not correct. A cavalry are soldiers mounted on horses. That is not what we do here. We don't have any soldiers or horses. Calvary is the place of the skull. That's where Jesus was crucified. And that's what we rally around. That's where we're Calvary Fellowship. Calvary is somewhere else. So just, we're just all getting on the same page. Okay. Um, now, as they crucify Jesus, they want to give him something to drink. And, and the Gospel of Mark tells us a little bit more about what it is. It says, they offered him sour wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they, they, give, they would give people this to dull the pain as they were being crucified. Jesus refuses it. And then the soldiers, we learn, are gambling to divide up his clothes, which is actually a fulfillment of a Bible prophecy in Psalm 22. In fact, I'll read it to you in uh, the middle section of Psalm 22. It says, For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me, they pierce my hands and my feet, I can count all my bones, that is, none of his bones were broken, they look and stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing... They cast lots. Now, 
Every Jewish male wore five pieces of clothing, every Jewish male. He had a turban or a headband around his forehead. He had sandals on his feet. He wore a belt. He wore an inner tunic, kind of like a nightshirt. And then he wore, uh, the fifth thing was an outer tunic or a robe. Uh, Romans, the Romans crucified people naked. And that was just one of the ways that they just made this a public act of humiliation. And they wanted to make it so gruesome that no one would ever want to challenge Rome or they would end up like this, which is why they always crucified people uh, very publicly. Now, um, so they, they, they took off his clothes when they crucified Jesus, and so now these five pieces of, of clothing are available. John 19 tells us that there were four soldiers. So each soldier takes a piece of clothing, and then, uh, according to John 19, it was the inner cloak that they were kind of arguing over and who was going to get it, and so they roll the dice instead of ripping it into pieces, not even realize that they're fulfilling Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 22 in the process. Now, we kind of meet a random person in this process, and that is a guy named Simon from an area of Cyrene. Now, Simon was Jewish. Cyrene is an area in North Africa. There was a huge Jewish population in North Africa um, because it was still not that far from uh, Israel, and they could still come up for the feast. So he's in town for the Passover with his family. I mean, this is essentially a family vacation. And he's there in the crowd, and he sees he just sees Jesus, he sees the crowd, sees Jesus carrying, uh, carrying his cross, and because they're having difficulty, uh, the Roman soldiers want this over with, so they just pick him randomly out of the crowd. You, grab this uh, cross and take it. Now, Roman soldiers could force you to do stuff like that, and you had no recourse legally. So, now, I'm sure Simon is thinking, what, how, this is the worst day of my life. I mean, I'm, I'm here with, uh, for the feast. I'm here to celebrate the Passover. Today is Passover, and I'm carrying some criminal's cross that I don't know. But that experience changed him and changed his family. In the Gospel of Mark, we read this. Uh, Mark writes this. It says, And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Now, uh, some of you don't know this, and this is an important little nugget to know, and that is that the gospel of Mark is actually Peter's account. It is Peter's, Peter's account of the life of Jesus, and John Mark was the guy who, he was the scribe. He's the one who wrote it. Mark was from that same area in North Africa where Simon was. And so, now, he writes this, um, Peter s dictates the, his gospel to him in uh, and Mark writes it down in the city of Rome shortly before Peter's death. He mentions Simon. He mentions his kids, Alexander and Rufus. Why? Because these guys were known in the Christian community. Simon, as we learn, becomes a Christian, as does his whole family. This is why in the book of Romans, when Paul writes uh, to the Romans, he mentions them. And in chapter now if you read the New Testament, you read Paul's letters. You know, sometimes it gets to the very end and it becomes very personal. And Paul's like, hey, when I'm going to get there, I borrowed a book from somebody. I'm going to get it back. And hey, there's this cloak that I left. Can you grab that? Hey, well, let's get together. Tell so-and-so I said hi and I'll see them next time I'm back in town. Well, anyway, in Romans uh, chapter 16, there's a bunch of that that he, that he says hello to. But he says this in verse 13. He says, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. You see, Simon becomes a Christian, his boys become a Christian, his wife becomes a Christian, and his wife becomes not, is not just the mother of Alexander and Rufus, but the Apostle Paul says that woman has been like a mother to me as well. And Rufus, he greets because he's like, hey man, this is, this, guy's, this is my friend. Now, I don't know about you, but I think every parent wants their kids to have quality friends like the Apostle Paul, right? And how does that happen? Let me tell you how that happens. If you want your kids to have friends like Paul, you got to do what Simon did, which is bear the cross. You start passionately walking with Jesus, and they will follow after you. Um, because that's just the nature of, of what kids do. And it, it's, it's just how it is. And I know they're, no, that's not really, that's not my kids. That's not, you know. And I know sometimes as dads, we're like, man, I hope that they're not following after me. Uh, but they will. Because, because kids do not do what they're told. They do what is modeled for them. Now, uh, when my son Xander, my son Xander is almost 14, but he was, uh, when he was three, he wanted to do everything like his dad. And it was very sweet. He wanted to make sure every morning he made sure he would find out what I was wearing and he would wear the same thing. 
And if he didn't have the exact same thing, it was at least the same colors. And, um, and if, you know, if he wasn't wearing the same thing, he would go change. So one day, um, I'm, I'm wearing this orange polo. Now, I don't know who buys an orange polo, but apparently I did at some point. And, um, but he goes, so I'm wearing it, and then he comes out. He sees what I'm wearing. He goes back into his room, and then he comes out, and he's like, Dad, could you please put on a new shirt? I said, why? He goes, because I don't have anything orange. And I'm like, all right, fine, that's fine. And anyway, so one night, we order takeout for dinner, and uh, we order, you know, whatever, and some salads come with it. And so now, the way I add dressing to salads is the correct way, by the way. This is an important skill. You don't just learn stuff about the Bible. You're an important life skills while you're here, too. Here, let me tell you what rookies do. They get the salad, and then they just pour the dressing on top, and then they're done, and then they start eating. And then they get three bites that have dressing, and then the rest of it is nothing. It just tastes like earth. Listen, what you're trying to, you're trying to mask the taste of the salad. That's what the dressing is for. All that lettuce is just a vehicle for dressing in your life. Anyway, so what I do is I pour the dressing on, I close the container back up, and then I shake it so that there is a mixture that takes place. So I do that. And then my son, Xander, he grabs his salad and he does the same thing. He's watching, he does it, and then he closes it and he's like, Dad, I will be like you. And, um, and he's, on, he's at the other side of the table and he starts shaking the salad box. Uh, the problem is, is that he was holding the wrong end of the box. So he starts shaking and I mean, it's like a salad explosion and it starts going everywhere. And it goes all over him. It goes all over the floor, all over the table. And then Xander, it's, it's on his face. And so he's wiping vinaigrette off his face. And he's like, that was not like dad. And it's like, no, it wasn't, buddy. And uh, now, here's the point. Dads, I'm telling you this. Your kids are modeling their lives after you. And you could say that they aren't. Or you'd say, or they, they might even tell you that they aren't, but li- I'm telling you, they are. If you want to transform your family, and all the stats show this to be the case, when mom comes to church, more than likely she comes to church alone. When dad comes to church, everybody comes, and everybody comes to Jesus when dad comes to Jesus. And here, this is the point that I'm making. Your kids are modeling their life after you. And um, if you want to transform your family, follow the example of our brother, Simon. You know what Jesus said in in, uh, chapter 9 of the Gospel of Luke? He says, if anyone wants to come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. And that's what our brother Simon does. He carried the cross and everything changed. His entire legacy was transformed for generations because of this. Well, look what happens next in verse 38. It says, then two robbers were crucified with him one on the right hand and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagged their heads and saying, you who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders said, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. So if you pause there and give me your attention, the first thing that we said is that the cross is changing my legacy. The next thing is that the cross is also changing my eternity. Everyone around the cross is mocking Jesus, even the people that are being crucified with him. Now, remember, Jesus was crucified. He was on the cross for six hours from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. And at some point between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., one of those mockers that's on the cross has a change of heart. And here's what happens in Luke chapter 23. It says, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. I want you to think about what this man asks Jesus. Jesus is being crucified right next to him. He knows it's the end for him, but he also believes that it's not the end for Jesus. 
And he comes to this revelation that not even the cross can stop Jesus. That's why he addresses Jesus as Lord and submits himself and asks Jesus for the hope of the resurrection. And, and Jesus gives him even better news. No, it's not just the resurrection of the dead. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. The promise that we have that the moment we take our last breath on planet earth, we will take our first breath in God's kingdom. You see, here's the reality is that it, it was only in those last moments of life that this man really started to live. And why do I say that? Because we were all created to know God. And God loves this man so much, this criminal, loves him so much that he parked him right next to Jesus on his last day of life. And it's amazing to me because remember, at crucifixion, everybody's gone. You're separated from your friends, your family. You're even separated from your clothing. Everything is gone. And when everyone was gone and he found himself absolutely alone, Jesus was next to him. My friends, you and I were created to live in community. You, because you and I, this is why the last couple of years have been so difficult, because we were not created to live in isolation. And so we were created to live in community. We were created to live in fellowship with God and in fellowship with his people. And that's why the greatest things in your life are never the things that happen alone. They're always the things that happen when you can share them and celebrate them with others. And I, I, I learned, one of the times I learned this lesson was years ago. Uh, my friends and I, we used to have this Tuesday night thing where we would play the, uh, in Miami Lakes, there's this par three golf course. And so we would play on Tuesday night or Tuesday kind of in the evening uh, before the sun went down, we would play this par three golf course. You can get through the whole thing in about an hour and a half. So it was four of us that we would consistently play. So I get there on Tuesday night and my three buddies all cancel on me. And I think, you know what? Uh, my, with my playing, I could probably use, use the, the practice. So I decide to play the round by myself. I get to the second hole, which uh, if you've never played that golf course, that the second hole is only about 80 yards. So I get my pitching wedge and I drive and I see the ball land on the green. I grab my bag, I put it on and I walk to the green and I can't see it. So I think, man, maybe it, I know I saw it land on the green, but I thought maybe I just had, you know, there was kind of too much roll on it and it rolled into the rough. So I, I go across to the rough to see if it's there. It's not. Then I start walking around and you know, once again, it's starting to get dark and I'm not, uh, I can't, you know, it's not broad daylight. So I'm looking, they have lights on and all that. So I'm looking around. So I'm like, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I shorted it. And so I'm walking across the green to look at the front. And as I'm walking, I just kind of take a look at the hole. My ball is in the hole. I hit a hole in one. I start going crazy. I throw my pitching wedge up in the air and I start dancing around like I'm in the sound of music. And, uh, and, and then I have this realization that I am alone dancing around a golf course at dusk. I mean, people must have thought I was insane. Um, and so, and by the way, um, once again, I was alone. And to this day, none of my friends believe it actually happened. They're like, you are making that up. Like, I'm not, ma who makes something like that up? Um, well, maybe, but uh, I know I'm not. And so, but here's the question that we got to ask ourselves. Um, that, listen, in, in this guy's moment of total isolation, he wasn't alone. Jesus was there with him. But here's the question that I, I want to back up for a second. I want to ask this question. Why did this have to happen at all? Why does Jesus have to die in the first place? And I, we say, well, he died to forgive us of our sins. Yeah, but why couldn't God just forgive us? I, I mean, we forgive people and we don't require a sacrifice. So why, are, why do we do something that, um, why is it that God requires something that we don't require? I mean, if someone cuts us off in traffic and then we see them and they're like, hey, sorry about that. And you say, hey, I'll forgive you, but give me your spare tire and we'll call it even. We don't do that. We just say, hey, you know, it's okay. Um, so why does God require something to forgive that we don't require? And there's a reason for this. So let's start at the beginning. And the beginning is in my older sister's basement. Um, it was one Thanksgiving. I was there. Now, you got to understand, I have a lot of family in Boston. So when we do Thanksgiving in Boston, I mean, this, we're talking like 50 people all crammed into my my sister's house. My sister's kind of the matriarch of our family. She's the one that keeps in touch with everybody, knows what's going on, and gets everybody together, and it's great. And um, so, but we were playing, and they had a built-out basement. They kind of turned it into somewhat of a game room. So we, I was playing darts with my nephew. 
One of them went upstairs and the other wasn't paying attention, but it was my turn and I hit the bullseye. And I, you know, I do what I do. I start going crazy because I'm so competitive. And now I knew that I had won and they had lost as it should be. And so, um, and, and the problem is they're like, oh no, we didn't see it happen. That didn't happen. And they're like, Uncle Robert, you're always joking around. And I'm like, I do not joke around when it comes to beating you. Uh, this is important. It's serious. And it's important for you to lose to your uncle and maybe even cry. And so anyway, well, they're like, it, this isn't, now, um, even if I, which I did hit the bullseye, but, but even if I hit the bullseye once, I miss the bullseye regularly. Now, why do I bring that up? Because when the Bible talks about sin, the Greek word for sin is this word hamartia. It's actually an archery term. And the word hamartia means to miss the mark. That's why in the book of Romans, when Paul says, for all have sinned, that is hamartia, all have missed the mark and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and whenever we mess up, whenever we sin, whenever we say what we shouldn't, whenever we do what we shouldn't, whenever we fail to do what we should do, it's missing the mark of perfection that God has established. That's the standard, perfection. The second question we have to answer is, what's the penalty for missing the mark? Well, at the beginning of creation, God told our very first parents what the standard was and what the penalty was. And he said this in Genesis chapter two, the Lord God commanded the man, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. This is the price for missing the mark, death. The harshest sentence possible. This is the part that we struggle with, and we think it's too strong. We think, you know, God should forgive me because I'm generally good. And, and listen, I'm not even arguing that. I, I, I will even agree that you're generally good. The problem is that's not the standard. Generally good is not the standard. That's not the bullseye. Good enough is not the standard. Perfection is the standard. In fact, to take this point even further, James, the half-brother of Jesus, says it this way. And for the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. So if you murder someone, you have broken the entire law, even if you do not commit adultery. You know how to, here's how we would explain that. It's like getting pulled over in your car for doing 80 in a 45. And when the cop shows up to ask you for your license and registration, you say, but officer, let me tell you all of the laws I wasn't breaking. I had my seatbelt on. And when I really gunned it into 80, I, I used my turn signal to go from, from the, to the other lane. That's why I shouldn't get a ticket. That's not the way it works. Justice demands payment. That's why Jesus died. And here's the point so that God can be totally just by setting the highest possible standard and the harshest penalty, but he's also incredibly loving by paying the price on our behalf. You see, why do we forgive and, and not ask for a sacrifice? Because we forgive arbitrarily. We forgive who we want, when we want, if we want. God's forgiveness isn't like that. It's not arbitrary. We want God to be just, and he is. And so if he's going to be just and forgive me, he has to forgive you. And if he forgives you, he's got to forgive everybody. But what would, I mean, if God only forgave certain people who kind of were generally good, we would cry in outrage. It's not fair. It's not just. So what God does, and this is, this is the key to it. What God does is that he sets the standard to satisfy his justice, ensure fairness, and then show his incredible love for us. That although God's justice demands a standard of perfection, in his grace, his son is the stand-in to meet the demands of the father. Maybe we could say it this way. God says, here's what constitutes good. Be perfect. But because I know you can't be perfect, I'll be perfect for you. That's why Jesus died. That's why God can offer forgiveness to anyone who comes to him through the cross of Jesus. My friends, that's what makes it good news. So, Look at what happens in verse 45. It says, Now from the sixth hour, that's noon, until the ninth hour, 3 p.m., there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of them, those who stood there when they heard that, said, This man is calling for Elijah. 
And immediately one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. And the rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And if you pause there and give me your attention. The cross is changing my legacy. It's changing my eternity. And lastly, the cross is proving God's love. Jesus made seven statements from the cross. This is statement number four. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a quotation from Psalm 22, a psalm about the sufferings of the Messiah. And why would Jesus say that he was forsaken? Because he is quoting the Bible to those who were mocking him. Jews had a system of teaching and learning that was called remiz. Remiz is a Hebrew word that means a hint. That's why Jesus asked so many questions. It was part of his teaching style. But the remiz would be a question pertaining to a Bible passage. So the rabbi would quote a text, but the answer was the verse before it or the verse after it. So if the rabbi, if the question came up, um, what color is the sky? The rabbi would say, well, roses are red. And not to say the sky is red, it's the next verse that uh, violets are blue. And so, and, and once again, that's why if you don't realize that, the Gospels are a little odd at times because maybe you've read the Gospels and Jesus says something at the, to the Pharisees which seems semi-innocuous and then the next verse says, then they decided to kill Jesus. And you're like, whoa, these guys are on edge. Um, and it's because we're missing the remiss. We're missing the teaching under the teaching where he's saying something against him, they got it, and then they were bothered by it. So Jesus is quoting Psalm 22 because there's a little section in Psalm 22 that pictures this moment in what's happening. In fact, let me read it to you. This is uh, the, middle, the middle section in Psalm 22, verses 6, 7, and 8. He says this, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake, uh, they shake their head and say, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. It is almost verbatim what they said to Jesus when he was on the cross. Now, if you are a note taker, and I hope you are taking notes, um, I want you to circle that word worm, which is in verse 6 of Psalm 22. Circle it, and I want you to write this Hebrew word toliath, T-O-L-A-I-T-H. That word toliath is throughout the Bible. It, it, a lot of times it's translated scarlet. Um, it's translated scarlet because you would take these toleoth worms and that's how you would make scarlet colored, colored clothing. But the toleoth worm, the way it reproduces, and this is what David, the, the writer of Psalm 22, is talking about. Little did he know how apropos it would be. Um, the toleoth worm reproduces itself by fastening itself to the trunk of a tree. And it will die almost exploding, it, it, uh, bearing its young. Then the young would, would be birthed and they would eat the body of the toleoth worm so that all that would be left was this scarlet mark on the tree. After about three days or so, that spot would begin to dry. It would turn white and then flake off like snow, which gives now a lot of um, deeper meaning to what God tells the people of Israel in Isaiah chapter one, where he says, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. So I want to close, and I want to talk about the crucifixion for a moment. Most of us know, as I said in the opening, most of us know that Jesus died, but few of us know how Jesus died. And um, I'm indebted uh, to the work of Dr. Mark Eastman uh, for this, uh, where he details the crucifixion from a physician's perspective in his book, The Agony of Love. I mentioned earlier that the crossbar... Um, it was about 75 to 100 pounds. Once again, the pictures that are shown of Jesus kind of carrying the whole cross are not really accurate historically. Uh, the Romans would have the vertical part of the cross. Those would already be established. Those were stationary in very public places. Um, and then the, what the person would carry is the crossbar, which was very heavy, which is why after Jesus is scourged, he's barely standing. And that's why they have to get Simon to help him carry it to uh, Golgotha. Now, what happens when they get to Golgotha? Th then Jesus is placed on his back with his arms outstretched and he's nailed to the crossbar. The nails in that time were generally about seven to nine inches long. The nails were placed between the bones of the forearm and the small bones of the hands, essentially in the wrist. 
uh, what are called the carpal bones. The nail placement would have several effects. First, it would ensure that the victim would hang there until they died. The second thing is, is that the nail that was placed there would sever the largest nerve in the hand that was called the median nerve. The severing of this nerve really caused this uh, medical catastrophe. In addition to severe burning pain, the destruction of this nerve causes permanent paralysis of the hand. The second thing that was important, the way the Romans did this, is that they, the way that they would position the feet. Uh, they would flex the knees at about a 45 degree angle. They'd be bent forward. And then they would take an iron nail about nine, seven to nine inches long and uh, drive it between both feet and the second and third metadarsal uh, bones. In this position, the nail would sever the dorsal uh, pedal artery of the foot and there would be bleeding, but not enough to cause death. The resulting position on the cross sets up this horrible sequence of events which results in a very slow and painful death. Having been pinned to the cross, Jesus now has this impossible position to maintain. As the strength of his legs begin to give out, the weight of his body must be borne by his arms and shoulders. The result is that when, within a few minutes of being placed on the cross, his shoulders become dislocated. Later, the elbows and wrists become dislocated. The result of these dislocations is that the arms are now six to nine inches longer than normal. With his arms, shoulders, and elbows dislocated, considerable weight is now placed on, is transferred to the chest, causing the rib cage to be elevated in this state of perpetual inhalation. Consequently, now Jesus has to exhale. Um, he, he has to push down on his feet to kind of push himself up to be able to get some oxygen and then be able to exhale. The problem is he can't do this for very long because his legs are extremely fatigued. As time goes on now, Jesus is able to bear less and less weight on his legs, causing further dislocation of the arms and the further raising of the chest while making breathing more and more difficult. And now I'll quote directly from uh, Dr. Eastman when he says, the result of this process is a series of catastrophic uh, physiological effects because the victim cannot maintain adequate ventilation of the lungs. The blood oxygen level begins to diminish and the blood carbon dioxide level begins to rise. This rising CO2 level stimulates the heart to beat faster in order to increase the delivery of oxygen and remove CO2. However, due to the pinning of Jesus and the limitations of oxygen delivery, he can't deliver more oxygen. And the rising heart rate only increases oxygen demand. So this process sets up a vicious cycle of increasing oxygen demand, which cannot be met, followed by an ever-increasing heart rate. After several hours, the heart begins to fail, the lungs collapse and fill up with fluid, which further decrease oxygen delivery to the tissues. The blood loss and hyperventilation combines with severe dehydration. This is why Jesus says, I thirst. And over a period of several hours, combined with the combination of collapsing lungs, a failing heart, dehydration, and the ability, inability to get uh, adequate oxygen supplies to the tissue eventually causes the death of him who was crucified. The victim cannot breathe and slowly suffocates to death. In cases of severe cardiac stress like this one in crucifixion, what happens is called cardiac rupture, which is where the victim's heart bursts. Therefore, it could be said that Jesus died of a broken heart. My friends, Jesus was forsaken so that you would never have to be. All of the religions of the ancient world up until today believe this, that if you are sick, in trouble, hurt, or poor, that is all a sign that you are forsaken by God. And Christianity comes along and tells us this, that our leader Jesus was forsaken by God when he was crucified so that those who follow him would never be forsaken. He was the one who was restless on the cross, shouting, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we could find a rest that is only found in him. So my friend, if you have ever wondered if God loves you, does God forgotten you? Does God realize what's, what I'm dealing with? My friend, we have to look no further than the cross 
Because at the cross is where Jesus didn't simply say that he loved you. He proved that he loved you by dying for you. You see, this is why now the parable makes sense. The parable that Jesus told in Matthew 13 when he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And he found one of great value. And he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Jesus is the merchant. You are the pearl of great price. And he sold everything, gave his life for the one thing he didn't have. You. That's how loved you are. Let's pray together. And Lord, we want to thank you. And, and yet thank you doesn't seem like even enough for all that you've done, for how much you suffered, for the depth of your love. So Lord, we say this, that thank you is not the end, but it's the beginning. It's the beginning of a life that we commit to following you, to honoring you, to walking with you, to taking up our cross daily and following you. Because Lord, we want to love you in the same kind of way that you have proven your love for us. And we pray it in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen. amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus and begin a relationship with him, congratulations. It's the best decision you're ever going to make. You may be wondering, so what happens now? Where do I go from here? Just text BEGIN to 62488 and we'll be able to send you this free gift. It's a book called BEGIN written by Pastor Bob and it's going to help you take those first steps on your new journey of faith. So remember, to stay up to date with everything happening at Calvary, follow at my Calvary on Instagram and Facebook. Until next week, we love you, we're praying for you, God bless you.